Okay, everyone. Well, we're now coming to what I hope will be the finale of the last two days of truly remarkable conversation. It's been a wonderful event for many reasons, partly because the discussions have been very rich, partly because it's been very timely, partly because it's been a beautiful setting and the weather has cooperated and we've had fabulous food, but I think also because after 18 months of being locked down and unable to travel, it's been truly fantastic to get together in flesh, in person, and talk to each other face to face. Hooray. We're still not back to normal, but by golly, does it feel good to be halfway back to normal. And it's particularly good because, as many of you know, the last in-person meeting that took place here finished with a very lively in-person debate between two people who love to go at it. And they go at it much better in flesh than on television screens, I can tell you. They're pretty hard to control in, in real life, probably easier to control on a television screen because I can just switch them off when they're talking too much. But this evening, we have them in real life, in person, having a very hopefully lively debate about a crucial issue of our time, which is this. We're going to have an Oxford-style debate, and I'll explain in a moment how it works. But the motion which is going to be discussed, and I'm going to ask you all to vote with your hands on this in a minute, both before and after the debate. So keep listening. Don't fall asleep yet. The motion is this. A new Cold War cannot save a warming planet. A new Cold War cannot save a warming planet. What that basically means is should we adopt a position of real politic, not worry about values, cooperate with people who we consider to be our enemies in order to tackle some of the really hot issues of the day, whether it's climate change, pandemics, AI, et cetera, et cetera. So should we embrace real politic in a warming, if not hot world, or should we instead stick with values and say, actually, there are fundamental disagreements in the, in, on the, in the world today, be that with Russia or China, and that actually we should not be embracing real politic at all costs, because actually we need to club together in the West and make a stand for what we think is important. So, a new Cold War cannot save a warming planet. Before I tell you who is going to argue for which side of the debate, although I ma imagine many of you can guess already, <laughs> I won't give away any clues yet, I'm going to ask you all to vote with a show of hands as to which way you go. Because the way that an Oxford debate works is that I ask you to vote at the beginning. I take a note very roughly. This is not a scientific experiment. If you're feeling a bit shy, or you don't quite know yet, or you want to hear what these two amazing arguers are going to say, you don't have to vote at the beginning. I'll put you down as an abstention. But what we're going to see is whether they can persuade you, sell you on their ideas or not. So I'm going to see whether they change your minds in the course of 30 minutes. And then what happens is I'm going to ask each of them to present their case for five minutes. They're not allowed to interrupt each other no matter how much they want to. They can't make rude faces at each other. We are in real life. Then they each have two minutes worth of rebuttal. I will then ask them a few questions. They then have a closing statement, and then we vote again. So that's how it works. So we're going to start with you all in the room. Who thinks that a new Cold War cannot save a warming planet? We should embrace real politics not values. Okay, one of you. You're either all asleep or you're shy. Who thinks that we need to basically embrace real politic, that a new Cold War um, is actually necessary in order to deal with the big planetary problems? Okay, rather more of you. Okay, interesting. So we currently have a majority in favor of um, re uh, in favor of a Cold War over real politic, in favor of taking a stand rather than simply swallowing our values.
but I will just say the majority of you are either asleep or shy or I've spoken too quickly and you didn't actually understand what I was saying at all. That happens to me a lot in America with my English accent. But anyway, I'm going to start with Fareed, who is taking the argument for a new Cold War cannot save a warming planet, and he's going to argue why we need to embrace a real politic, and the clock has started now, Fareed. You have five minutes to convince us. Can I begin by saying, uh, Julian, that you're looking beautiful, and this is my, my way of flattering you in the hope that I get a little bit more time? Um, <laughs> no. So I want to make clear what I am arguing for, because I think Julian has expanded brilliantly the the conversation from the pure uh, proposition. The proposition is uh, a Cold War cannot save a warming planet. And what I want to say is a Cold War cannot, uh, will not allow us to do the kinds of things we need to do collectively in the world. That the major threats we face in the world today are ones that cannot be tackled by one or two countries alone. They are, they are challenges that have to be addressed collectively. And that a Cold War makes that kind of collective action impossible. So let me start by telling you what I think is the dominant trend in, of the last generation in the world. And it is what I've described as the rise of the rest. So for 400 years, the West has been dominant. And over the last 30 years or so, you have seen a new phenomenon happen, which is that the so-called emerging markets or Asia, or call it what you will, some co combination of countries that were left out of the dominant power structures of the world have been rising. The numbers are fairly simple. 25 years ago, emerging markets constituted less than 5% of global GDP. They now constitute about 45% of global GDP. The single largest country in that group is, of course, China. 25 years ago, China was 1% of global GDP. Today, it is 15% of global GDP. And so that trend, the rise of the rest, means we are in a fundamentally different world than the world that Neil Ferguson nostalgically looks back to when he wants us to, you know, Give it, give it one more, give the Cold War one more great try. It's a wonderful, nostalgic effort to make America great again. Um, but here's the problem. The United States in 1950, when the Cold War began, was about 50% of global GDP. The Soviet Union was maybe 10. Um, very, people have d differing estimates. But the point is the West in particularly once Europe rebuilt, was the absolute dominant player economically, militarily, technologically, socially, politically in the world. And the world we're in today is completely different. You have a China that is the largest trading partner of a majority of the, of a plurality of the countries in the world. There is no country that, ha that has a greater number of number ones than China does in that sense. Ukraine's largest trading partner, by the way, it's China, not the United States. Uh, and that is true for almost every country in Asia. Uh, I think Bhutan is, a, is, in, is an exception. It is true of almost every country in Latin America. Um, and so the reality you face is a world in which you have not a new number one, but a power of enormous consequence politically, economically, technologically. You heard Eric Schmidt talk about China's prowess in technology. You also have other countries, by the way, that are crucial to the ability to get anything done in the world. A country like India, a country like Brazil, Indonesia. And my proposition is very simple. We have to find a way to work with these countries, to cooperate with them, because the threats we face are all collective. We're going through one of them right now. This pandemic is a perfect example of a global threat and it will not be successfully solved unless we have some greater measure of global cooperation. Climate change is obviously the ultimate existential threat, and it will not be solved unless we can find some way to work together. But there are so many other opportunities, not just threats. 
to restart global trade in a way that lifts people out of poverty, uh, that gets rid of disease, malnutrition, and death. Those kind of things only happen with global cooperation. The last two trade rounds have collapsed, by the way, not because of China, but because of India and Brazil. And so what it, what it emphasizes is this is not a question of realpolitik. If I could just amend one way. Um, yeah, 20 seconds. What Jillian was saying. We're, we're cooperating with Saudi Arabia. They don't share our values. I'm simply saying we should cooperate with countries like China, like India, like Brazil, perhaps especially China because of its size, just like we cooperate with Saudi Arabia, who, by the way, have had 10 years ago the same policy toward women that the Taliban does today. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, essentially, what you're arguing is that a Cold War is so 20th century, so last century. The world has moved on. The power balance has changed. We're already collaborating and cooperating with countries with, who have different values, and we should do so even more now. Okay, so Neil, tell us why a Cold War is not so 20th century and why your ideas are not so fuddy-duddy. And I'm going to start the timer to make sure you both have exactly the same time and you can't fight about that as well as everything else. Ladies and gentlemen, a new Cold War can save a warming planet. In fact, it may be the only way to save a warming planet. It's not me who's suffering from nostalgia. It seems to be my friend Fareed who looks back longingly on the days of win-win cooperation with the People's Republic of China. And he has the nerve to cite the pandemic as evidence. How did that win-win strategy go for the rest of the world when China decided to cover up the outbreak of COVID for weeks on end until it spread around the world? Are we in a new Cold War, ladies and gentlemen? Let's start with that question. The answer is yes. And if you don't believe me, how about listening to what Xi Jinping said on July the 1st in Tiananmen Square to mark the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, where he made it clear that his idols are Karl Marx and Mao Zedong. He said, we will never allow any foreign force to bully or oppress or subjugate us. Anyone who would attempt to do that will find themselves on a collision course with a great wall of steel forged by over 1.4 billion people. It's not nostalgia that I hear there, it's Mao-stalgia. Now, how does Cold War relate to climate change? Let me tell you exactly how. Because it's only through Cold War strategies that we are going to be able to pressurize China to mend its globally harmful ways. Since Greta Thunberg was born, which was in 2003, rather shockingly, <laughs> global coal consumption has risen by 39%. The People's Republic of China accounts for 93% of that increase. Nearly all the increase in coal consumption in the world since Greta Thunberg was born is China. Let's turn to carbon dioxide emissions from all sources. Those have risen by nearly a third since Greta Thunberg was born. China accounts for 64% of that increase. Two-thirds of the increase in all of the world's carbon dioxide emissions since Greta Thunberg was born in 2003 are accounted for by China. China is not going to change its ways listening to Fareed. We know that. Because win-win has been Chinese rhetoric for you restrain yourselves and we carry on our own sweet way and nobody, and I quote, can bully, oppress, or subjugate us. And you'll hear more of that when we say to them, as John Kerry has just tentatively started to do, hey, could you possibly stop building those freaking coal-burning power stations? Because if you charge your Teslas with coal, it's not going to save the planet, the planet's going to burn. The second point I want to make relates to Fareed's conversation with Eric Schmidt. Listening to Eric over the last few years, I've heard him move from win-win 
to a funny word, coopetition, which I never liked, to a recognition that China poses a serious national security threat to the United States, not least in the area of artificial intelligence. The lesson of the Cold War, and this is the last point I'm going to make, is that when the West focuses and realizes the nature of the threat from a communist regime, its technological innovation accelerates, and the only way we're going to save the planet is through the, precisely the kind of technological innovation that will come from this competition. So ladies and gentlemen, it's only using Cold War tactics that we can save the planet, because only by containing China can we save the planet, and only by out-innovating China can we save the planet. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Well, I, Neil, this has to be the first time in history that you've actually not used up your allocation of time. You have 23 seconds left. Is there anything else I'm you want to say? I'm reducing my own emissions, Gillian. <laughs> Okay, slightly less hot air. One of the great things about doing debate with these guys is that they are ultra competitive. They're both best-selling authors. They both are public intellectuals, widely admired. They're both boys, and they like fighting. So there we go. But let me turn next. Oops. Let me turn next back to Fareed. You have two minutes to answer what Neil has said, that actually we need to get very tough with China, we need to start a new Cold War, because that's the only way to actually get serious action on climate change, technological threats, et cetera, et cetera. Two minutes, let me quickly start this timer, so you have exactly the same time as each other. And you can start now. So I think, in a way, Neil has made this very easy for me, because I ask you very simply, do you believe that the way you are going to get China to do something that is, you know, for the benefit of the planet or restrain itself, is by beating up on them, building more nuclear weapons, threatening their existence, cordoning them off from the world economy, um, and bullying them? If you do, I think you haven't heard of the word nationalism. China is a very proud ancient civilization. The idea that you will be able to just remake it because you're tough on them or because you dominate them, I mean, this feels to me so bizarre a theory and so likely to backfire and boomerang and produce an even more spirited uh, Chinese response uh, that I don't know where to begin. I mean, we have tried to, re we couldn't remake Afghanistan in our image, and we are now going to say that we're going to, with a little bit of adroitly applied pressure, manage to remake China. Um, it feels to me like it's, it's all very well to, to make this kind of stirring nationalistic speech as, as, as Neil is on, you know, on our side, but the truth is this. The term win-win, which Neil Ferguson is now decrying, uh, was actually coined by somebody who I think he would admit is a superior Scottish intellect than he is, and that is Adam Smith. Adam Smith basically pointed out that, you know, if countries actually find ways to compete uh, with, you know, it created, oh, oh, the overall pie grows and your share becomes larger. Well, guess what? That is what is happening. That is what has remade the world for the last 300 years. And it is still happening today. So guess what? In the middle of this incredibly brutal U.S.-China war that's been taking place, what has happened to U.S.-China trade last month? It hit an all-time high. Okay. Okay, Neil, first of all, I should ask, do you accept that Adam Smith was a superior intellect to you? <laughs> yes, but I do not accept that the words win-win appear in the wealth of nations. <laughs> well, you can all, all of you who've got economics degrees can scurry off and see if you find the words win-win in the wealth of nations. He was a more elegant writer than, than, than to say win-win, but the concept exists. Well, Adam Smith lived in an era where there was no Twitter and no tweeting, so um, every, all the sentences were ten times longer. Okay, Neil. Are you completely unrealistic in terms of thinking that a Cold War is going to fix anything? And you have two minutes starting now. Three things. Farid has not learnt the lessons of the first Cold War. The key to the Western victory in the first Cold War was containment, recognition of the threat, and then containment of the threat posed 
by the Soviet Union. Let's also learn the lessons of COVID. The Western world allowed China to increase its influence over the World Health Organization so much that the WHO brought, bought uncritically the lie that there was no human-to-human -human transmission in the early outbreak of COVID uh, in December and January of last year. And that illustrates, I think, very, very well indeed why we cannot expect a strategy of cooperation to work in any other domain. Because the Chinese Communist Party does not act in good faith, whatever the threat is. Whether it's biological or climatic, they will say one thing and do another. Pledge to be carbon neutral, but like St. Augustine, not yet. Not until some distant date in the future. But we also need to, to take the opportunity of this date to learn some lessons from 9-11. I think the great lesson of 9-11, and Tony Blair made this point in his conversation with you, Farid, is know the enemy. Understand the threat the enemy poses. We did not understand the threat posed by Islamism and jihadism until the Twin Towers fell. Only then, long after that threat had materialized, did we get it. Ukraine understands this. Ukraine understands the importance of knowing the enemy. Ukraine has good incentives for reasons we discussed yesterday to avoid climate change. Ukraine, where the 20th century made it the land of disaster. And Ukraine has good reasons not to trust an environmentally toxic communist regime. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well. Well, this is the point in which I get to ask you both questions, and you can lob at each other if you want. I'm in the center, so I'm the net between this tennis match. But let me start with you, Fareed. Is there any, any regime in the planet today that you think should not be cooperated with? Would you cooperate with North Korea? Well, it depends on what you mean by cooperation. Would I cooperate with North Korea to try to get rid or limit its nuclear arsenal? Yes, I would. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't view that as endorsing North Korea. I view that as a practical effort to deal with some of the issues that would be in our collective benefit. China, by the way, um, you know, Neil has painted this extraordinary picture of China as a kind of new Nazi Germany. But China has, by and large, abided by most of its international agreements. To give you one example of the way in which he's playing with words, the WHO is weak and cannot enter countries against their will because the founder of the WHO, the United States of America, designed it as such because the United States did not want the WHO going into American cities and demanding uh, you know, uh, cooperation or evidence. That, that is why the charter of the WHO does not allow the, uh, the, the uh, people in Geneva to push back against China. The issue is very simple. Do you believe that there are common problems that can be addressed? Neil talks about China as the great emitter of the world. It is actually reducing its coal consumption. The great increase is coming from democratic India, most of it being sold to India by democratic Australia. China is trying to become the world's leader in electric cars. It is trying to become the world's leader in high-speed rail. Again, Neil has a picture of, of the world that is sort of charmingly antique. The real world we're in is that China is trying to dominate green technology and green energy, and that is why there is an opportunity for some small measure of cooperation, which is important because this is too big. You know, honestly, this is too big an issue for us to be doing sort of silly debating points. You really are talking about the health and existence of the planet. And do we really believe that you shouldn't be trying to find every way you can to get 1.5 billion people to do something about it? Neil, charmingly antique. How do you cope with that in relation to the fact that China is indeed a world leader in green technology? Well, charmingly antique might just be another way of saying historically accurate. <laughs> Remember, and I think Farid has forgotten, the nature of a Cold War. A Cold War is preferable to a hot war. 
But I think it's also preferable to appeasement, which is another word for what win-win turned out to be. If one looks at the dynamic of the World Health Organization and does it in a historically accurate way, there has been a steep decline in the effectiveness of that institution. When the SARS outbreak happened, so effective was the WHO that it got the Chinese health minister fired for his attempt to cover up the origins of that outbreak, which were, of course, in China. Fast forward to 2020, the very opposite sequence of events. In 2020, the Chinese government appears able to cajole the World Health Organization into relaying its lies, and also, by the way, ignoring the highly effective response of Taiwan next door, as if Taiwan simply didn't exist. The right lesson to learn from the Cold War is not, as I think Farid is trying to represent it, uh, as some kind of throwback uh, to the days when America was great. That, that's not really the point I'm making. I'm arguing on behalf of the free world, which was the other side in the Cold War. And I'm arguing that the best way of dealing with an a totalitarian one-party state that clearly poses a threat to the world is by containing it. Containment included negotiation. At times, it included detente. We must, of course, negotiate with China. But we have to negotiate from a position of strength. We have to link issues together rather than treating the climate issue as something separate that we send John Kerry to do, that's, that's the kind of unrealistic approach that guarantees that the China will be, will be for climate change what it has been for global public health. True, a pandemic is a much faster moving disaster than climate change. But the climate change disaster is like COVID in slow motion. Let me remind you, two-thirds of the increase in CO2 emissions are from China. Fareed may say, oh, but they're going to reduce their coal consumption, but they haven't yet, Fareed. Yes, they're buying a lot of Teslas, but they're charging them with incredibly dirty power. So the lesson of history, not only from the Cold War, also from COVID and from 9-11, you must know your enemy, recognize the nature of the threat the enemy poses, and then use the techniques that worked so well in the Cold War, containment, as well as coercion, linkage of issues, to achieve what we achieved in the Cold War, which was to bring that deadly regime to an end. And that ultimately, I think, must be the goal of our strategy in Cold War II. Because the world, a world with a Chinese Communist Party running the second largest economy, perhaps even soon the first, is not a safe world. It's not safe from pandemics. It's not safe from climate change. Well, I want to can I, can I just please do, yes. So I, I think it is very important to understand that I don't believe that we have the, the power to decide who gets to rule China. Um, if, if we did, I would absolutely, I would, I would put Tony Blair in charge. But I don't think we have that. I don't think he wants the job. Uh, we, I, don't, I don't believe we have that capacity. And I think it's very important to get your mind around that. It's, this is such an American idea. Neil has spent enough time in America that he is now an uber-American. Uh, the idea that we know best what other you know, how other countries should be governed. And that you know, if we could put our guys in the, the, into China, they would run China right. The second point I would make is, he, Neil talked correctly about the importance of thinking about this as the free world because the United States is not what it was in 1945 or 1950, as Afghanistan has just shown. So I would ask Neil to go and talk to people in Germany and ask them whether they are clamoring to sign up for this Cold War. Ask them whether they're clamoring to sign up for it in Britain, where his own uh, uh, friends, uh, George Osborne and, and David Cameron, laid out the red carpet for China because they want London to become one of the hot spots where Chinese wealth, in industry, and finance will go through. Ask him whether he finds that you could find any countries in Asia uh, other than 
Taiwan, Japan, etc. You know, a few don't others forget to India. sign up for. Don't it. forget India, Fareed. Don't India is India. most decidedly not. I, trust me, I know India well. <laughs> what, what, why have they joined the Quad if not to help the United States, Australia, and Japan to contain China? If if what you say is true, why is it that the Pew's, Pew Group's research, in survey after survey after survey, shows? negative sentiment towards China, and specifically to the Chinese Communist Party, has soared over the last two years. It and with good mean, reason. I am not a making the case People for China. People have seen the true nature I am not of making the, the case for China. I am making the case that it exists, and that it is large, and that it is consequential, and that you cannot solve global problems by fantasizing that you are going to topple the regime. The way you are going to solve global problems is by finding a way to negotiate with them. And if you want to do it under a rubric called detente, I don't care. I think it's more important that we solve the problem. Um, and, and if you want to continue to harbor the fantasy that you will be able to topple the regime, fine. What I am saying is you need to negotiate. We need to find places where there are, yes, win-wins, and that we find a way to to actually deal with this existential threat, which is climate change. Um, that right. is the real existential threat. If China is truly an existential threat to the West, let me just remind you, the United States has 3,000 nuclear weapons. China has 300. Yes, it is building them, but that doesn't strike me as a country that is trying to destroy the West militarily. What they are trying to do is outcompete us, and frankly, we will waste a lot of time rather than actually competing with them economically in confronting them geopolitically. Right. Well, you each have now two minutes of closing statements. And I'm going to start with you, Neil, for your closing statement about why you think that we should be going gloriously, charmingly antique and embracing a Cold War again. And the clock has started. I wonder how many of you know who first used the phrase Cold War. It was George Orwell. And he first used it in an article in 1945, in which he foresaw that a world with nuclear weapons would be dominated by great, and as he imagined, totalitarian empires. It took years uh, for most people to realize that Orwell was right. One of the curious features of Cold War I is that most people didn't really believe it was real until 1950 when North Korea invaded South Korea. I, I see the same state of denial when I listen to friends like Fareed talking about the US-China relationship. It's like they haven't woken up to the reality that Orwell saw in 1945 and I feel that I've seen over the last few years. We've already entered Cold War II. It's not an option we have. We're in it. It's economic. It's ideological. It's strategic. It's geopolitical. And it's existential in just the way that Cold War I was. But it's different technologically. It's not that China is going to build a nuclear arsenal equivalent in size to that of the United States. It doesn't need to. The threat in this new Cold War is different. And it ranges from the threat of cyber warfare, full-scale outages that shut down the grid in all of Western countries at a critical moment, to the issue that we've debated tonight. That the planet is warming is undeniable. I think I have persuaded you that China is the principal driver of climate change in the world today, and it has been for most of this century. Are they going to mend their ways if we're just nice to them? If you believe that, then you need more antiquated history. <laughs> so in defense of history. Well, Fareed, you've also written a lot about history in your books. Um, tell us why you think Neil is completely wrong. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I'm reminded of something, a history professor of mine, uh, somebody uh, Neil probably knew, Donald Kagan, the great historian of ancient Greece, once said to me, he said, History doesn't ever really repeat itself. It only appears to, to those who don't know the details. And I think that it really is such a mistake to think we are still in that world that George Orwell was describing. 
I mean, it is such a different world that we are in. As I said, for after 400, 500 years of Western domination, it's difficult to get used to the idea that, you know, and you can tell Neil is struggling with this, that, that you just don't get to dominate and dictate and, and determine the fate of billions of people around the world. Uh, the truth is, China has risen. It is going to r continue to rise. We can't turn that switch off. It might, be, it might be great if we could, for all kinds of reasons, but we can't. So we have to confront that reality and ask ourselves what we will do. Neil said, know the enemy. And I think this is a very important point to ask ourselves. China is not Russia. Russia has acted as a spoiler state. All it does is destabilize. That destabilization actually jacks up energy prices. So in a weird way, Russia benefits from instability. China is much more a classical great power that is simply trying to become more and more and more important. And it has always prized, as a result, stability. That is why I point out it has, in, the United States is not the world's most, uh, you know, or rule-based country. I mean, if you look at the number of times the United States has intervened militarily in other countries over the last 25 years, you will get most of without, with, with, without UN mandate, you understand what I'm saying. So there's blame enough to go around. Everyone acts in their interests. But I come back to the simple proposition, again, that great Scottish intellectual, Win-win. Are there ways that we can work with a China that is 15% of global GDP going to 20% within India, with others, to deal with what is the great existential threat we face, which is climate change? Well, thank you. Well, I should say that quoting one great Scottish intellectual to try and squash another Scottish intellectual is the ultimate form of intellectual jujitsu. So um, there we go. But anyway, well, we have had a lively debate. I think their positions actually hardened and became more distinct as we went down, which is always a sign of great debate, always a sign of great television as well. But now is the moment of truth, where we're going to see whether they actually convinced any of you to change your minds. So in the absence of any of those clever machines to actually vote anonymously, I'm going to ask for another ho show of hands again to see whether most of you agree with Fareed or most of you agree with Neil. So all of you who agree with the proposition that a new Cold War will not save a warming planet, that we need to actually have real politic and cooperate because we're actually living in a 21st century and a Cold War is so last century. You're loading the question. <laughs> Just state no. the motion. You know the rules. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, all of you who agree with Fareed, raise your hands now. Okay. Very unscientific. I reckon that's about 40%. All of you who agree with Neil that actually we are in a world of new Cold War and we have a problem because I think we're just about equal. Can it's I going to go to penalties. Can I solve it for you? <laughs> There's a very simple way to solve this. Victor Pinchuk, in the first vote, voted with Neil. He's, in the second vote, he voted with me. I That's think an I oligarchical the outcome. I think I, I won. won. <laughs> as, Ron, as, Ronald Reagan, as Ronald Reagan said once when somebody tried to take the microphone away from him, he said, wait a minute, I'm paying for this microphone. Well, v I Victor is paying for all three microphones. You're being paid <laughs> for <wins>. this microphone. <laughs> exactly. Well, what I will say is I think there was slightly more, a fraction more, who did actually go with Neil. However, however, in terms of people changing their minds, either because they were asleep, either because they were asleep at the beginning or didn't understand the question, actually there was a greater increase in support for Fareed, which is a way, as a mother... When I had toddlers fighting in the sandpit, I used to say, well, you've kind of both won. So I'm almost saying that now. So.